Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to tonight's lecture. And it's my great pleasure to welcome back uh, Professor Dominique Moisy. You may be familiar to many of you from previous lectures in the series he's given at King's, but for those who don't know him, a few words of introduction from me. Um, Professor Moisy is a founder and senior advisor at the French Institute for International Relations. Professor of, at Institut d'études politiques, or Sciences Po, and has been uh, a visiting professor at the Department of Politi Political Economy here at King's uh, since 2012. He regularly contributes to BBC News, France 24, Foreign Affairs, Project Syndicate, and the Financial Times. He is Amongst his notable contributions have been the acclaimed The Geopolitics of Emotion, How Cultures and Fear, Humiliation and Hope Are Reshaping the World, which was published in 2009. This is the fourth lecture in the Triumph of Fear series, and Professor Moisey is ninth here with the King's Policy Institute. I know that you will enjoy tonight's lecture, and so I get a plug-in for the next lecture, which is on the 5th of March. And it's in, oh, pardon, the 6th of March, and it's entitled How to Transcend Fear. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first, uh, I'm very grateful to all of you who were brave enough to uh, go beyond the underground strike and are uh, with me uh, tonight. So far, I have been looking at fear opposing fear in Western Europe, which I thought was mostly dominated by a kind of identity quest. Who am I? Fear in America which contain ver various elements, but mostly that fear of decline. Am I still what I used to be? Fear in Asia, where for the elite, the risk of war is a very real one. Is 1914 Europe a precedent for 2014 Asia. Then in my last class, uh, I dedicated myself to Middle Eastern fears. And uh, I emphasize the fear of failing again, which followed uh, the Arab Spring and the difficulties that censorship uh, and tonight I want to deal with planetary fears but I'll do so again through a regional prism planetary fears link to the process of globalization the creation of an interdependent, interactive, transparent world. Clearly, you have the fear of global pandemics, the fear of uh, global warming and the warming of the planet and its consequences on uh, migration, what would happen if in some parts of the world life was to become totally impossible. Fear of not being at all in controls of one's life and the desire to leave where you are for political as much as climatic reasons. 
and there is a continent I've not dealt with before that seems to be a metaphor for all these planetary fears. A continent which is at the origin of humanity, a continent that for four to five centuries has been neglected, subverted, dominated, used, declassified again, and that is, of course, the African continent. To what an extent is Africa encapsulating, representing a summary of everything we hope for and everything we fear for. And if you just look at the African continent today, there is a disconnect, nearly a divorce, between statistics and images. The images you see from Mali to South Sudan are images of violence, ethnic, tribal, or purely political, or sometimes religious. This week in Paris, uh, the first trial of a man accused of uh, crime against humanity in Rwanda 20 years ago has just opened. But this prevalence of violence and misery which you see on your television screen, which you read in your newspaper, is in stark contrast with economic, demographic statistics. There is a part of experts who are definitely Afro-optimist and they have a very good case. Average economic growth in Africa, at least for sub-Saharan Africa, for more than two-thirds of the country, has been superior to 6%, which is today the highest economic growth in the world since Asia is doing less well than yesterday, and since Latin America is doing much less well than it did yesterday, in particular its giant, Brazil. <coughs> so if you think that the BRICS are passé, you look towards Africa as the seat of the new emerging powers. And there are a lot of figures that would justify that. If you take demographics, for example, Africa today, with more than one billion people, represents 18% of humanity, which is a little less than what Africa was in the 16th century, when Africa represented with 100 million people 20% of world population. But in the 19th century, Africa had only 95 million people and represented only 9% of population. 
of world population. And of course, in between the 16th and the 19th century, a major phenomenon had taken place, which is slavery, the trade of slaves, which was at its peak during the period of enlightenment. Enlightened Europe considered perfectly normal to use men of a particular color coming from a particular place as a pure commodity. And in fact, philosophers at that time were quoting Greek philosophers, saying, well, slavery was normal at the time of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. So we're not doing anything new, except that slavery in the 18th, 17th century was based on a particular element, which was the color of skin. Today, and since the 1950s, Demography rise has been mind-boggling in Africa. In fact, African population has multiplied by 10, which is the highest demographic growth we've known in recent human history. And, sorry, let me specify that. There's 180 million African in 1950. There's more than 1 billion today, and there will be 2 billion in 2050. So it's, it's not a multiplication by 10 now, but it is going to be a multiplication by 10 in a century, which is absolutely spectacular. And this demographic rise has been, of course, accompanied by urbanization, the birth of metropolis, and huge <coughs> progress at the level of health, education, and to some extent, governance. So there is a sense of hope that is definitely growing in the African continent, which you can see in works of art. In uh, Paris in 2008, 2009, uh, I could see an opera called Sahel Opera, which was taking place in Sahel, and the end of the opera was extraordinarily symbolic. A woman was about to give birth, but she was dying because she had been uh, hit by a car from the Paris-Dakar uh, uh, race. And there was a debate between the chorus and herself. She was at the boundary of the Moroccan enclave in Africa. And she was pleading with the chorus. The chorus was saying, well, have your child be raised in Europe. You're going to die. Please help him build his future. And at the end, she decides, and that's the symbolic message, no, my child will be raised in Africa because I trust this continent and I want him to take part to the African Renaissance that my continent is experiencing and will experience. And the chorus celebrates the bravery and the wisdom of her choice. And you could find that again. I mean, in London, there was a marvelous uh, performance 
of Mozart, Magic Flute, by a group coming from a suburb of South Africa, playing with South African <coughs> instruments, and adding to the universal message of joy of Mozart a very specific African source of optimism and energy. And at the same time, when you ask African leaders, what is your primary fear in the world we live in today? Their answer is much more simple than the answer an Asian, a European, an American, or even a Middle Easterner would give. They would say, well, my fear is not to be able to feed myself and my children. Will I survive tomorrow? Because there's a shortage of food, because there's a shortage of water, uh, because I can be killed in uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, because nature is hurting me in many ways when man does not do so. So there is a sense that the primary thing you have to do is to survive. How do you balance these various factors? Some people are saying that Africa today is what Asia was 30 years ago that this is the seat of the new economic miracle. Is it so? Or should we say that it's not exactly the same thing? And if so, why will Africa not be the equivalent of Asia. Well, there are many reasons which can justify some kind of skepticism. The first one is that in Asia you have giants like China who are driving the growth of the continent. And there is a competition of a nationalistic nature between the various countries of Asia, which is key to an understanding of the Asian miracle. Rivalry. In fact, many people have said that one of the reasons why Europe fell asleep in the last decades was precisely the fact that there was not enough rivalry amongst the principal European powers. There was competition, but mostly on the soccer field. We felt too close to compete and at the same time, too different to unite completely. But if the competition between China, Japan, South Korea, India, and now the Philippines, Indonesia, whatever, led to the Asian miracle, who are the equivalent countries on the African continent? There's a giant that keeps disappointing its supporters. That is Nigeria. There is a miracle, South Africa, which gave a universal message of reconciliation to the world and of hope to the entire African continent, but whose immediate future seems to be 
in doubt. We don't know uh, where, where, whether South Africa can really continue to do it. Then there are more fundamental factors linked to history and culture. The African continent has been, to a large extent, deliberately ignored in its history, in its essence, by the Western world. We know the history of big Asian empires. We are familiar with Chinese civilization. We know that in the fifth century before Christ, the Chinese mastered water by creating dam. And they are rightly very, very proud of it. But we ignore completely that up till the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century, there were great empires on the African continent. We deliberately ignore the fact that Africa was totally integrated in world history and was a key element of it. Because before gold was discovered in Latin America, most gold came from the African continent. There were movement, interaction. Then it disappeared from the radar screen of a world more and more dominated by the West. Or to be more specific, it returned, but in a very negative way. Africans became commodities before Africa became an object of world rivalries. The casualties linked to slavery in direct number are, well, quantitatively one has to choose the word rightly one African out of ten died in the slave trade directly ten millions which is more or less the equivalent of the number of Africans who've died from HIV aid, 10 to 15 million. So it's significant, but it's not gigantic, except that the psychological cost in terms of self-image of this monstrosity uh, was much more important than its pure quantitative dimension. And as slavery ended, I must remind you that it ended very late in the country where it was the most quantitatively important, Brazil, 1888, the very end of the 19th century, 20 years after the United States of America, 21 years after the United States of America at the end of the Civil War, 60 years after uh, it was abolished in uh, different European countries, but much later, 
And at the very moment, European decided to abolish slave trade, they decided to engage in what was called the scramble for Africa. And they devised land lined on the sand to divide amongst themselves the African continent. And here again, the economic, geopolitical, emotional cost of colonization, followed by a decolonization that was a deliberate failure to a large extent. Not only we did not prepare our colonies for independence, but we tried to make sure that the process of independence would take place in the worst possible conditions. So, as to maintain our influence. So, this add some negative elements to the chances of Africa to be the equivalent of Asia. <coughs> A deliberate ignorance of history, a deliberate violation of uh, their right to decide about their future by themselves. And the question which must be asked today is a huge one. Europe and the West at large are ending their preeminence upon the world. Is it the time for Africa to re-emerge as the sleeping beauty that was forced to sleep in the beginning of the 16th century and that would know after so many years would retake her normal position in the history of the world. And here, the Africans can say, our time has come. Because you need me more than ever. You can't do it without me. And from that standpoint, it's very interesting to consider the various evolutions from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 21st century. 1884-1885, the Congress of Berlin. Europe divides Africa amongst its various powers key role of Bismarck, who in a way is at that time the balancer and maintain Germany in a relatively low profile in Africa. World War I, just visit the cemeteries on the French soil and look at the thousands and thousands of graves of African soldiers who died of coal, disease, if not of bullets and guns. African came to the rescue of Europe, but in a way nearly as commodities, imperial commodities, 
than World War II. My country, France, maintained through General de Gaulle the legitimacy of its fight through the empire. France was defeated on the metropole, but could continue the fight, the good fight, on the African soil. Then the Cold War came, and Africa becomes one primary seat of superpower rivalry. Even if there is, at that time, what is called the non-aligned movement and the attempt by people like Nasser or Nkrumah to define an intermediate position between the two giants, which are the United States and the Soviet Union. Then the Cold War ends, and suddenly you see the peak of the international declassification of the African continent. She's no longer a stake in the Cold War rivalries. She does not exist. But then three things happen which are transforming the world in which we live and the place of Africa in that world. The first thing is the end of apartheid in South Africa, the Mandela declared miracle, which is totally linked to the end of the Cold War. The Soviet Union has disappeared. The ANC knows the truth should come. And on the other hand, the embargo has worked. And the white regime of the Clare knows that if white want to keep living in Africa, they must give power back to the black majority. Not back because they never had power. But one man, one vote, that means power will be Africa. The second revolution will come from the rediscovery of Africa for its resources and energy and primary materials. And here, China has been playing the key role. You may look at it with some criticism. You may say the Chinese were animated by self-interest, greed, fear of losing power for the regime if the energy resources coming from Africa could not keep the process of economic growth going up. Nevertheless, I think historians will, in retrospect, look positively at the Chinese role in the rediscovery of Africa. Because China was followed by India, by Brazil, and suddenly the African look at themselves, turn around. Maybe if they are interested in me, it is because I'm truly interesting. Maybe the future belongs to me. And the external eyes change the way Africans look at themselves. Now, let's go back to this balance between huge fears and tremendous hope. And uh, why is Africa a metaphor? Because to a large extent, it is in Africa that we see 
the highest cost of climate change. Desertification leading to migration. People leave because simply there's not enough water and therefore not enough food to keep living in that part. And you have the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, which is the place where the boats of the richest encounter the small boats of the poorest, of the most desperate, those who are risking their lives to have a future elsewhere. Then it is also in Africa that you've had the presence of the highest pandemia, HIV AIDS. I was struck by one figure which followed 9-11. Remember 9-11? 3,000 people were killed in two separate attacks. Well, 3,000 people died. At that time, it was the number of people dying every three hours in South Africa, which was quite spectacular. Now, the process has been slowed down, partly mastered but not by far eradicated. Then you have something else, which is the global fear resulting from global terror. And terrorism plays a specific role on the African continent. And from that standpoint, there is a direct link between Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East at large. The creation of what some analysts are now calling Sahelistan, Afghanistan, Sahelistan is the direct product of the overthrow of Gaddafi's regime in Libya. A lot of weapons, a lot of terrorists had to move elsewhere. They moved to Mali, they moved to Niger, they moved to some part of Nigeria. And so suddenly, in this weak spot where you have failed states in very large number, you have this source of great disorganization and threat. And in fact, if you look at fear, not the fear that Africans feel about themselves, but fear that are coming from Africa for Europeans. Well, you combine shortage of food and water, bigger demography, failed state, terrorism activity, and here comes the main preoccupation. How can we make sure that Africans are going to remain in Africa? How can we stop a process of migration that is in fact not spectacular 
in quantitative terms, but that is important, again, in psychological terms. And here is the debate. What is the best thing to do if you want to make sure that African will have a future in their continent? How can you guarantee their success? Aid. But a lot of African writers, thinkers, denounce the process of aid. They say, we don't want to be helped. If you want to help us, just proclaim and practice fair trade. Pay what we produce at the price it should be paid. We don't want to be help because help, aid, will nourish <coughs> corruption. We'll make sure that the rich get richer and that by the end of the day, the poor will not get better off. And what is very interesting within that framework is that it is in Africa, more than anywhere else in the world, that you see the plague of energy wealth. One country, Equatorial Guinea, a giant like Nigeria, a middle-sized important country like Algeria, they are all in their respective ways victims of being energy rich. Leaders don't need to make their population work in the right way. They will corrupt their people the way they are corrupt themselves. And countries that used to produce agricultural product in large quantities are now importing them simply because they find it easier to buy it with their energy resources than to produce them. This is clearly the case of Algeria. So to return to my question and to end up my remarks, It is most likely that man was born in Africa. It started here. Life started on the African continent, which is not neutral. But is the African man today? Is the African continent today? The place where this balance between hope and fear will be decided. There's so much hope coming from Africa and so much fear coming from Africa. Where will the balance be struck. And clearly, the answer will come from the African themselves. And it should be so. They should be responsible for their history and their future. We should not dictate to them what they should be doing to move in the right direction. Let's not betray them one more time. Matt, uh, I will, I spoke 45 minutes. Uh, I will stop here uh, to leave time to questions.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As in previous sessions, a huge amount for us to think about, but um, now I invite members of the audience, please, to, uh, to raise any questions that you might have. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. <coughs> um, you, you mentioned um, China's involvement in Africa and its interest for the African resources as a positive um, element, but um, do you really think it could be a factor of empowerment for African countries and the African people when we know that countries like China or even con countries from the Middle East just buy lands and then these lands don't belong to the countries anymore and they, they don't belong to the people anymore. So do you think this is a factor of, of empowerment for Africans? Well, there is a statistics I read which surprised me. There are one million Chinese living in Africa. It's a, it's a very large uh, uh, number. Uh, it means that Chinese men are living in Africa but in conditions that are not so different <coughs> from the conditions in which Africans themselves are living. If you remember white colonialism in the 19th century, uh, the white colonial officer had a life that was completely different from the life of the African themselves. They were separated. And Africans realize that Chinese work as hard as they do to live in conditions which are as difficult as they do. And I think that psychologically makes a huge difference. So, of course, uh, I'm not naive. I'm not playing Mother Teresa uh, in my understanding of the Chinese attitude. And one of the reasons for the Chinese success is the fact that clearly they had no colonial heritage and no democratic handicap. They were saying to the African leaders, I don't need you to be a democracy in order to help you. I help you because I need you. That's a good deal. I build roads, I build hospitals, whatever you want me to, uh, and you give me sell me uh, your energy resources or your rare material. But it didn't do a good thing. It started a dynamic which would not have been possible without them. That's why, in spite of everything, I think the uh, Chinese role in Africa has been globally positive. It's a daring sentence to say. It goes against many things. Uh, but they did make a difference, and a difference for the better. Thank you very, very much. Um, I wanted to pick up what you said about aid and creating corruption and aid dependency. Uh, but linking that to energy, uh, if Africa uses all its fossil fuel resources or sells it to China or anyone else, um, climate change will run out of control. So is there a case for giving them money not to use that? Because we're responsible for most of the pollution 
up there already. So paying them to develop clean energy, not because we're helping them, but because we are helping them, helping ourselves, is that a way to get round aid dependency? One of the many answers uh, to that issue has been to help local society and in particular the instruments of change and progress in Africa, i.e. women, who for cultural, sociological, historical reasons have been the uh, mechanism uh, for change. So you give money, micro money, to those villages uh, through micro credits, for example, uh, who will make a difference. You don't go to the capital. If you start in Lagos, the money will stay in Lagos. And I heard Africanist, which I'm not, you noticed, saying quite interesting things. They said governance will be reinvented for the world on the African continent. Because not only the boundaries of Africa are artificial, but the institution of the state is artificial. Governance in Africa, in reality, goes through extremely different mechanisms. And hearing them, it reminded me of something else, which I'm much more familiar with, which is the motto of European Union propagandists who are saying we are in Europe reinventing the concept of sovereignty for the 21st century. Sovereignty in a global age. Now, it didn't work so far in Europe very well. So I can see your smile. Will it work better in Africa? I don't know. But to a large extent, you know that if you give money to a central authority, the chances it will be spread is slim. Is slim not non-existent. I mean, in sub-Saharan Africa, you have one-fourth of the countries that are reasonably democratic, which are led by people, new generation of leaders, animated with a sense of common good. Some of them see their models not in the Western world, but in Asia. The president of Rwanda, uh, Mr. Kagame, sees himself as an African Lee Kuan Yew and very openly says, my country is going to be the Singapore of the African continent. I think he exaggerated, he exaggerates his qualities, but it's very interesting that he should think so. And there are countries like, in fact, Uganda, Ghana, even Somalia today, which is much better than it was yesterday, uh, which have been going in the right direction. 
when many countries in Francophone Africa, like Ivory Coast, or have been going in the wrong direction, or going to the pit, like the Central African Republic, uh, where there's no power, uh, where you have a failed state, uh, French intervention, uh, but which does not lead in a clear direction as I speak. So it's, it, it's a very uh, difficult question. How, how do you organize help, help at a micro level? It's one of the answers. Uh, thanks very much. Professor Morsi, you sort of spoke about Africa as, the, as a homogenous continent. It's obviously sort of 53, I think, or now 54 states. In terms of your metaphor, I mean, and you sort of talked about the sequence of the First World War, Second World War, Cold War, and present or more contemporary situations, so though they were discrete phases, and obviously with spatial uh, variants, <clears throat> and you've still got sort of colonial legacies, the French bases throughout Africa, intervention in Mali. You've got the Nile with Chinese investment in Ethiopia and American intervention in Egypt. <clears throat> so ultimately, sort of disaggregating your metaphor, which parts of Africa do you believe will sort of still remain in some of those temporal phases that you explained in terms of World War II and Cold War, and which ones will break away in terms of the hope that you sort of state that they may fulfill in being being self-governing and actually fulfilling their promise that they've been wanting to fulfill for so long. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, well, the natural answer you would have given 10 years ago would have been South Africa will be a model for the rest of the African continent. Um, it did something that happened only in Western Europe, reconciliation. And it has a working state. It has an army. In fact, at the end of the 1990s, uh, one was dreaming of seeing South Africa as the regional gendarme of the UN in that part of the world. Because Nigeria was not doing the job. Uh, because Kenya uh, was not performing uh, the way it should have performed. Hope was in South Africa. I'm not sure this is the case today. There is disappointment in the post Mandela period. And in fact, the emotional outburst uh, that followed the death of Mandela was as much for a dream man that incarnated everything that's good in man. And you can say, well, uh, if Mandela exists, life is worth living. But it was also containing an element of anxiety. My God is gone, and there's no one else to fill his seat. And not only for South Africa, but for the African continent at large, and maybe for the world in terms of image. I mean, it's very interesting to see that Pope Francis uh, came to be an object of nearly adulation now. Uh, beyond the Catholics, uh, at the very moment, uh, the Pope disappeared. The, the, the secular Pope that was Mandela has, has just disappeared. But I think there is little more hope today for Nigeria to play 
its natural role. It's not working well. There's still a lot of corruption. But economic growth keeps at a stable rate. And there are changes deep inside that are taking place. What seems to me the most interesting is the interaction between Sub-Saharan Africa and Northern Africa. There is a model of hope on the African continent, a country that has made its revolution. And that may be on the path to democracy, a country where Islamists and secular have come together to sign a new constitution in harmony, and that is Tunisia. Tunisia is an African continent. And there is another country which, in a way, was perceived, or should have been perceived, as, for a long time, as African too, and that's Egypt. And in fact, many African thinkers were saying to the West, you ignore us. But look, we were civilized before you in Egypt. There were black pharaohs in great civilization linked to Egypt. Why do you ignore us so much? And it's in a way returning, coming back with some sense where is the Arab Revolution going? What is its meaning for the African <coughs> continent at large? Because it does not only concern the Middle East. It concerns the world of Islam. And the world of Islam is in part the African continent. I realize it's a very unsatisfactory answer. Um, There are countries that are very successful in Africa. They tend to be small. And you don't hear about them. Bina is one of them. Botswana is another case. But they are small. And part of their success is linked to their small side. But they have been successful for a long time. Can they play? the function of role model if South Africa can no longer do it or if Nigeria does not succeed in doing it. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, as I'm maybe the only Chinese man in this arena, <laughs> so I have to say something for China. Thank you for your positive opinion about the Chinese uh, activities uh, in the African continent. Uh, actually, I want to say something about the China's Africa um, policies. Uh, according to some of the questions, most of, uh, some of the scholars link China's aid and uh, Chinese appearance in Africa with uh, corruption and some uh, negative things. Actually, uh, what we did is uh, quite, uh, the Chinese aid was actually put into, uh, put into the right place, I think. Uh, I've been studying in Nigeria for three years, and I've been to nine African countries and more than 50 African cities. And uh, according to my knowledge, ma most of the Chinese aid was sent to the civilians who is, who is in desperate need of uh, uh, malaria medicine and uh, some uh, other medical needs. And some of the Chinese aid was, made, uh, was sent to uh, build the uh, roads and uh, some other basic infra infrastructures. And uh, so the, uh, what's more, as for the corruption issue, I think long before the Chinese come to Africa, the corruption exists everywhere in the world. So there is no logical link between China's aid and the uh, African corruption issue. I don't think it's closely linked. 
And uh, maybe some people could criticize China for providing uh, aid to some uh, not good regimes or not good governments. But the aid actually is good for the African people, and we are positive to that. And what's more, we also want to remind you that uh, the full picture is that uh, China, although, although China invests a lot of uh, uh, mine, mines and uh, oil fields in Africa, we also help Africans tr to train lots of engineers and uh, medical care workers, as well as uh, some scholars in China. So we also do a lot of other things. So please see the whole picture. <laughs> and my, uh, we also, we not only give African fish, but we also teach them how to do the fish on, the, on their own. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and uh, my question is that um, uh, uh, recently there are also some new, um, new, uh, new words like uh, means. Some of the African countries was included in, uh, in this um, uh, concept. So in your opinion, will Africa catch up with the pace of other developing countries in 21st century? Is that a question? I think the question was, will African economies catch up in the 21st century? It is catching up already. <laughs> um, again, if I repeat the gist of what I said, Demographic factors are playing a positive role for Africa because though demography moves on for the first time in the last five years, economic growth has been slightly superior to demographic growth in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is new. I mean, in Egypt, it's not the case. In North Africa, it's not the case either. The second point is that health is improving, slowly but surely. Uh, the average life of African was considered a dark model. Russians spoke of themselves in derogatory terms by saying, we are the white Africa. Russian male would have a life expectancy of 59 years. It's still more or less the case in Russia, but it's more in Africa. So there is a change that is taking place. Education is very slowly but surely improving. I mean, the point I've been trying to make this time is that yes, like Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, I tend to believe that Africa is going to be the continent of hope. But at Africa is not going to become a second Asia because the ingredients are different. So trust Africa, but don't think that Africa tomorrow will be what Asia is today. If I could summarize exactly uh, the message I was trying to give tonight, this is that. Thank you very much. We have a rule with these lectures, which is that we, we finish at 7.30 sharp. And it's not quite 7.30, but given um, we have the tube strike and we've all got more challenging journeys home, I think we might be uh, allowed to finish a couple of minutes early. Um, as we do on every occasion, thank you so much for uh, such a thought-provoking, controversial, um, and insightful set of observations. And, for those of you who are first timers, or those of you who are here, please do try and keep the 6th of March free. 
But I think it remains uh, for me, uh, on behalf of, of the audience in the college, to thank you again for a treacherous journey to, to, to London and, and, and an outstanding uh, lecture. So I perhaps invite the audience to thank you.